Hello and welcome back to our presentations for International Plumbing Code Chapter 4, Fixtures, Faucets, and Fixture Fittings. We're going to continue on where we left off, starting at 4.13 and finish the chapter at 4.26. 4.13 talks about floor and trench drains. 413.1 once again goes over approval, just saying which standards these would have to meet. And 413.2 says that floor drains shall have removable strainers. You see that on all floor drains. That is a code requirement. But in addition to that, code requires that floor drains are readily accessible. It says ready access shall be provided for floor drains. That means that you should be able to walk right up to it and there it is. You don't have to like uncover it or move something or anything else. That is a requirement for floor drains. Also, there is a requirement for access to the inlet. That means like you can remove the strainer and you can get into the drain. There is one exception there where if you have a refrigerator, and this is particular to grocery stores. You're going in the grocery store and you're pushing the cart down the aisles and they have refrigerators and those refrigerators that are holding all the produce are going to have condensate that has to drain into somewhere. It could be detrimental if someone's pushing a cart and there's like a floor sink or a floor drain and they're like pushing it into that. And so what they do is they say you can have that accessible, meaning it's recessed under or be behind or in that refrigerator unit. But that's an exception. That's not a rule. 413.3, size of the floor drains. It has to have a minimum of two inch diameter floor drain, so two inch pipe coming to floor drains, that's a requirement. And 413.4, when it comes to public laundries and central washing facilities, this is for multifamily dwellings or other central washing facilities, it says that clothes washers shall be provided with floor drains located to readily drain the entire floor area. So. Any problems in that space should be able to drain to a floor drain and such drain shall have an outlet of not less than three inches in diameter. Again, two inch on a normal floor drain, three inch on a laundry floor drain. 414 is about floor sinks. Not much said here really, just one line pointing us to the standards of their manufacturing requirements. So let's go on to 415, flushing devices for water closets and urinals. I have pictured here a flushometer valve, but this section goes over those kinds of valves as well as tanks. But the fundamental requirement in 415.1 is that all toilets have some device in order to flush them, whether it's a flushometer or a tank, whatever. And 415.1.1 says that each fixture shall have its own flushing device. Can you imagine two bowls in one tank? <laughs> or maybe like you got a flushometer just like piped over to this one and over to that one you just flush it and they all go. No. One fixture, one flush device. 415.2 flushometer valves and tanks are discussed in depth and it specifies that access shall be provided especially for the vacuum breakers on flushometers. It also specifically states that adequate pressure must be provided for the flushometer. If you are not aware, a flushometer will not work if it doesn't have enough pressure. They just won't flush. So obviously that's going to have more to do with the rough piping, the delivery from the supply, the pressure in the building. But in the end, it has to have enough, that's a code requirement, to flush the toilet. 415.3 talks about the flush tanks and gives the requirement that that tank has to be able to automatically refill itself after each flush. You know, we have the fill valve that's going to take care of that for us. 415.3.1 gives us a little more definition on that fill valve. First of all, it has to have a backflow preventer and the way they stick up out of the water and there's little air holes in there, it has a backflow prevention built in to the fill valve. So that's taken care of for us, but that is a requirement. We wouldn't want water from the tank or toilet getting back into our potable water supply if there was a negative pressure and a siphon started to happen. And in addition to that, it is required that the fill valve be one inch above the overflow pipe. So there's the overflow pipe on the flush valve. The flush valve is that flapper down in there. It's called a flush valve. The flapper does the work. And it has a standpipe and the fill valve has to be one inch at least above that. We're keeping that gap, right? 
Now 415.3.2 talks a little more about that standpipe for the overflow and basically stating that it must be installed in a way that it will not flood. It's going to prevent flooding by letting the water down into the bowl. Now let me explain where this becomes a problem. If you put in a retrofit or a replacement flush valve, a lot of times they have an adjustable pipe for the overflow or it just is a certain length and you need to adjust that, trim it or bring it up or down. So I have seen these installed where that was not the case. They had that overflow like clear up, it's almost to the tank lid. Then the fill valve fails and it starts filling up the tank and it won't shut off. But there's a hole where the handle goes through the tank. And if that overflow pipe is higher than the hole where the handle goes into the tank, it leaks out that handle hole and floods the house. Now that happens. 415.4 says that flush pipes and fittings have to be non-ferrous material. That means they're not steel. That can be copper, brass, or most of the time, plastic. In 416, we learn about garbage disposals, but they have this fancy name for it, food waste disposer unit. You don't need to say that when you're out buying one for sure, but 416.1 talks about the standards and approvals for garbage disposals, but it also says that a garbage disposal does not add to the drainage fixture unit load. So you know when you're sizing for a drain system and you're counting sinks and toilets and trying to make sure you have the right size, you don't have to add extra just because there's a garbage disposal hooked up. It just falls under the sink drainage fixture unit that it's attached to. So there you go. 416.2 talks about the domestic food waste disposer waste outlets or the garbage disposals drain and it says it has to be one and a half inch minimum. Commercial is the same in 416.3. You get some bigger commercial units, they at least have to have a one and a half inch drain. A lot of times the plans are going to spec out something bigger anyway, like a two inch pipe. 416.4, water is required for garbage disposals and as you know most of the time it's simply the faucet that supplies the water to the disposal so that it can flush while it's grinding. But when it comes to the commercial units they're a lot bigger, they're usually built into a big stainless surface and they also need a water supply but sometimes there's not a faucet there. So they can be supplied by a separate cold water pipe but Here's a diagram of what International Plumbing Code would expect to see. You'd have to have a valve to turn it on and off, and that valve would also have to have some backflow protection above it. We have an atmospheric vacuum breaker here. A minimum of six inches above the flood level rim as required by backflow code in chapter six. But you can see the pipe comes up into the vacuum breaker and then back down into the disposal unit so that it can flush this is the way we protect our potable water from the disposal unit. 417 goes over garbage can washers. A garbage can washer is a fixture thing that you just take the garbage can, turn it upside down and blast the water into there, flushes it all out. It's great for cleaning a lot of garbage cans, I guess, but ultimately it will need a water connection and a drain connection and it needs to be trapped separately as its own fixture, have a removable strainer and be protected by an air gap. 418 goes over laundry trays. A laundry tray is a convenient fixture, especially if it's by your washer. You can go and rinse or wash whatever you need to out of the clothes if there's going to be a stain before you put it in the washer. But basically a sink, right? There are certain approvals listed in 418.1 and 418.2 states that we need at least a one and a half inch drain size for a laundry tray. 419 gives us information about lavatories. A lavatory is a fancy word for a bathroom sink. So that's what we're dealing with here. 419.1 gives the approvals for those fixtures, the standards that they would have to meet. 419.2 talks about cultured marble lavatories. This is referring to those sink slash countertops where it's all poured into one cultured marble piece. 419.3 states that lavatory drains have to have at least one and a quarter inch outlet. Now that's the smallest that is acceptable for drains. Most of the time we're dealing with one and a half inch traps on drains. But if you think about pop-up assemblies, all that, they've got one and a quarter inch drains. That's the bare minimum size for a drain on a lavatory. Interesting that it also mentions a strainer, pop-up stopper, crossbar, or other device shall be provided 
to restrict the clear opening of the waste outlet. So you know what it's like in a bathroom when you got stuff on the counter and like, you know, things are always falling in the sink. So it is a requirement that there's something down in there to stop objects from falling into the drain because it's just so easy to do, right? <laughs> So the stopper counts or a, a strainer or a cross piece or whatever. 419.4 talks about movable lavatory systems, gives a standard for that. That just sounds kind of out there like, yeah, let's just put this in there because it happens sometimes. 419.5, tempered water must be provided for public hand washing facilities. This means if you go to a public restroom, tempered water is required. That means 110 degrees Fahrenheit or less so that people don't get scalded. Section 420 goes over manual food and beverage dispensing equipment. That's basically your fountain drinks and it gives a standard for that. Section 421 talks about showers. Now look at your book. There's quite a bit in here on showers. Most of these are a couple of paragraphs as we talk about individual fixtures. This one's got a whole page. So let's go through and pull out some of the important stuff here. 421.1 talks about the approvals and standards manufacturers would have to meet. 421.2 talks about the water supply riser. That's the shower attachment. We have a picture on the top here. Whenever we have a shower head that has to be attached to the structure and supported properly. No shortcuts here. We want a solid, rigid shower head connection. 421.3 goes over the shower waste outlet. That's the drain. Minimum size one and a half inch. Now most of the time when we're installing a shower drain, it's going to have a two inch connection. That's typical for a shower drain. But think about a tub. A bathtub only has one and a half inch. And we definitely use that for a shower. So one and a half inch is the minimum. Showers have to have a removable strainer of not less than three inches in diameter. The strainer has to have openings not less than a quarter inch. So these strainers that we see on shower drains are actually very specific as to the requirements they have to meet for those holes and for their size. And of course, the floor has to be pitched or sloped to the floor drain. That just makes sense, right? 421.4 gives us dimensions for the shower compartment. So if you're looking at the floor, just bird's eye view, the minimum square inches is 900 square inches. You take the square root of 900 and you get 30 by 30. That's the smallest shower compartment that you can have. And that is measured from finished interior. That means like from the tile. So if you rough it in and you've got frame wall that's 30 by 30 inches, by the time you get the board and the tile, whatever's going in there, it's going to be less than 30 and it will not meet code. So it has to be at least that dimension when it's finished. The height of that finished surface and of the shower has to be at least 70 inches above the drain. Now they do give us an exception if you have kind of an awkward space. The minimum width can be 25 inches. We said 30 inches by 30 inches, but you can have it 25 inches. But then the square inches goes up. You see there's 1300 square inch requirement. That means this is more of a big rectangle that would give you room to like stand in there and maybe not a lot of room to turn, but it gives a little more shoulder space. So it's going to be a larger square inch area if those dimensions are less than 30 and they can't be any more narrow than 25. 421.4.1, we're going to look specifically at the wall surfaces and it says that they have to be not less than six feet above the floor level. That would be 72 inches and 70 inches from the compartment floor drain. So if you're stepping from the floor of the bathroom into the shower, you're probably stepping up from the floor drain at least 70 inches up. You'd have to have wall surfaces and from the bathroom floor at least 72 inches or six feet. 421.4.2 talks about access and this means like getting into the shower. Egress is an opening that you can go through and it has to be at least 22 inches. That's 22 inches of space out in front of the shower so that you can maneuver yourself in there and have enough space. <laughs> Boy, I told you there's a lot of stuff on showers, right? Stay with me here. 421.5, shower floors and receptors. Now, if we look at what surfaces we're going to be putting on, it has to be impervious, non-corrosive, 
I mean tile, cultured marble, well that's obvious, right? Fiberglass can work for that. But the surface has to be waterproof and non-absorbent, right? 421.5.1 talks about the support of that shower base. And 421.5.2, we look specifically at the shower liner. Now this is the pan that would go underneath the shower. A lot of times that may be installed by the tile or culture marble contractor or someone else. Uh, plumbers often are just asked to provide the drain or a four bolt drain where they can connect their pan into. But it's important for us to understand how this works and its code requirement. So when we look at the pan, the pan goes under the floor and it has to come up along the walls, along the studs, at least two inches. And it shall not be nailed or screwed or secured any less than one inch above that floor. You don't want to go shooting holes in this pan that's supposed to catch water if the tile fails. So we want to keep that up a ways so water can just flow into that pan underneath and not destroy the subfloor below, but it's going to be protected. It has to have a slope of a quarter inch per foot, so even the pan should be sloped. Materials are listed in there. And finally, 421.6 talks about glazing. This is in reference to windows and doors of the shower and says you need to go check this out in the International Building Code. 422 is all about sinks. This may be kitchen sinks or other sinks. Of course, we have their approvals in 422.1. 422.2 talks about the sink waste outlets and how this is the drain. It has to be one and a half inch minimum for sink drains. And once again, it says it has to have a strainer or a crossbar to restrict a clear opening of the waste outlet. Same thing with the kitchen sink. You don't want stuff just flying down the drain and disappearing. Movable sink systems are mentioned in 422.3. 423 talks about specialty plumbing fixtures. There's just some other things out there that are created for the use of water, right? Specifically in this section, there's foot baths and pedicure baths. They have to be protected against backflow, as usual, and the water temperature for these type of fixtures should be limited to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. In 424, we get information about urinals. 424.1 talks about the approvals and standards they would need to meet. 424.2 gives us information about the substitution of urinals for water closets. So earlier on in this chapter, when we looked at the number of toilets required for a certain occupancy, those toilets can be substituted out for urinals in the men's restrooms. In an assembly or educational occupancy, that would be like schools or stadiums or places like that, up to 67% of those toilets can be substituted out and urinals installed in their place. That's two thirds. Now in other occupancies, it's 50%. 424.3 goes over the materials surrounding the urinal. It is a fact that occasionally when people are using the urinal, they miss or splash a little bit. And so we put special material around there that can be easily cleaned, right? That would be two feet out in front of the urinal, has to have tile or something, four feet above the floor, and two feet to each side of the urinal. And this is why, as you look in most restrooms, the entire restroom has tile at least up four feet high. In 425, we learn about water closets or toilets. 425.1 talks about the approvals necessary, the standards that toilets would have to meet. In 425.2, it specifically states that water closets for public or employees must have an elongated bowl. This is why you don't see round toilets installed in public restrooms. 425.3 talks specifically about the toilet seat. Water closets shall be equipped with seats of smooth, non-absorbent material. Seats of water closets provided for public or employee toilet facilities shall be hinged and open front. So you can see in this picture, hinged means it's just got that hinge on the back to lift up. Open front means there's no lid and there's a gap in between the front of the seat. Now that's a public or commercial toilet requirement. Otherwise, it also states that whatever size bowl you have or shape bowl that you have, the seat has to match that. So that would mean don't use an elongated seat on a round toilet and don't use a round seat on an elongated toilet. 
425.4 states the water closet connection can be a 4x3 bend or a 4x3 flange. Those are both approved. And finally, we come to our last section, 426 on Whirlpool bathtubs. 426.1 gives the approvals and standards for Whirlpool bathtubs. 426.2, installation. When a Whirlpool bathtub is installed, it is required to be tested. That means you fill it with water, plug it in, turn it on, run water through the jets, and look for leaks. I've had them leak. You do not want to discover that after it's covered with sheetrock and tile and everything else, right? So it's critical that they be tested. Now, these Whirlpool bathtubs have a pump, and that pump is going to circulate the water in the tub, but that pump has to be above the weir of the trap. You have the drain, the trap of the drain, and that pump has to be above that because you wouldn't want drain water getting stuck in the pump or circulation system. That brings us to 426.3, where it talks about the pump, drain, and circulation piping. All of that has to slope to the drain. So that system is going to draw water from inside the tub and then pump it back out through the jets. But all of that piping that is connected to the tub and hidden behind walls and recessed inside has to slope to the pipe openings so that all the water can flow down the drain. Ideally, it drains down after each use. 426.4 talks about the suction fittings. It's going to have the vacuum side where it's pulling water, and those have to meet a certain standard that is listed. 426.5 talks about access to the pump. Again, there's a pump that's going to circulate that water, drawing it from the tub and pushing it back through the jets, but that pump may fail, and we have to be able to access that. So the requirement is that there is an access point of not less than 12 by 12, be able to get into that pump. If the pump is back in there a ways, maybe on the other side or in a hard to reach spot from an existing wall, and that would be anything more than two feet back from the wall where you're trying to access the pump, then it needs a larger access of 18 by 18 so that you can put half your body inside the wall and reach that pump. The opening is required to be large enough to remove the pump. So obviously you wouldn't want a smaller access point than that pump could fit through. And finally, 426.6 talks about the doors within the Whirlpool enclosure and gives a standard for that. Hey, congratulations. You've made it to the end of our presentations on fixtures, faucets, and fixture fittings. We've covered a lot of material here, a lot of information about fixtures and the installation requirements for fixtures. Definitely information that will be on the state journeyman test, but also, and probably more importantly, I hope that this chapter has helped you to understand the faucets and the fixtures that you install, the requirements around those, and maybe just the reasons why we do what we do. Keep up the good work and I'll see you next time.